Darren, you're the 2013 World of Allah champion, your first year at Casey Kane Racing, winning them their first championship. But let's go back to how it all started. How did you get your start in racing? Yeah, I actually have an older brother um, who's four years older than me. And um, when he turned five, uh, my dad got him started um, in quarter midgets. Um, so then when I came around, uh, you know, my brother was nine when I turned five. And uh, so we both started racing quarter midgets. As far as I can remember, you know, that was our family sport and what we did on weekends. And, and uh, we also played soccer and basketball, but, um, you know, it was kind of always our main focus on what we did as a family. And, and our favorite sport was always racing and quarter midgets and did a lot of traveling and stuff um, with those in the Texas, Oklahoma, Kansas um, kind of tri-state area. So um, that's basically where we got started. There's a lot of sprint car racing down in Oklahoma. You raced quarter midgets, micros, 360 sprint car with ASCS. But how did the World of Outlaws come about? How did you start racing on the World of Outlaw Tour? Well, I was fortunate like, in being in Tulsa, like you said, um, I think that was a huge um, you know, reason of why I was able to continue racing was um, in Tulsa back then, you could race quarter midgets. There was a very healthy quarter midget program. There was a healthy micro track that you know, the kids in quarter midgets um, looked up to the micro racers and then, you know, it was something they wanted to achieve after they moved out of quarter midgets and they could go do that. And then Tulsa Speedway had a um, very successful 410 program that they raced weekly. And, you know, when you race micros, you looked up to the sprint car guys. And so there was always an achievable goal that you could, you know, continue to move up the ranks and, and go and race. And um, so it's kind of died off since then. But in, you know, my time and era, there was always something that as a young kid you could see and look up to and, and try to strive to go and, do, you know, go and race and move up to a bigger class. So uh, growing up, there's a lot of kids I feel like were a lot more talented than I was like in quarter midgets and micros, but you know, they might've lived in a city that there was no other place for them to race. You know, micros were, you know, might've been the last step. There was no sprint car tracks around. So, um, you know, then we just kind of kept going on with sprint cars and then originally started with 360 sprint cars with ASCS, which was really big in the Oklahoma area. Um, and, you, you know, it was just, a, you know, an obtainable goal for a young kid to, you know, keep your mind straight and look at, you know, what you could go and, and do. And uh, that's why I think there's a lot of racers that came out of Oklahoma for a lot of years. So running the 360, how did you start off on the World of Outlaw Tour, touring all over the United States, going from just racing locally? How did that all fall into place? Well, we were racing our own car in 360 and ASCS. I first ran a sprint car in 96. and. Um, and, and then 97 um, with my dad's car. And then uh, halfway through 98, I'd still never ran a 410 race. Um, and I remember we were at Speed Week um, at Creek County Speedway and, and my dad's phone rang and uh, it was Joe Ray Blevins called. And uh, Lance was gonna have to be out of the car for about two months, I think, or at least six weeks. And uh, he called and asked if I could uh, fill in and, and run his car at Oklahoma City, which was the next week, uh, like a Tuesday or Wednesday. And then he wanted me to stay in the car through like right after the King's Royal. And I'd never ran a 410. Uh, so my first 410 show was a, an outlaw show at uh, Oklahoma City, which is one of the most intimidating places you can probably ever go to. And uh, was fortunate to you know fill in for him when he was hurt um, at that time of the year and stayed in it through the King's Royal and then actually finished the year um, in his car also. Um, so that was uh, basically how I got into running, did a partial schedule on the Outlaw Tour in 98. And uh, being in Lance's car at the King's Royal, we actually won our heat race and won a dash uh, the first time I'd ever been there. And uh, Gil Sonner, who owned the 47 car, the Casey's General Store car, saw me there. And that's basically that heat race or that dash um, uh, was what got me hired to drive the 47 car in 99 on the, on the full Outlaw Tour. Some people say that running a 360 and then going to 410 is a lot different with the 410 being a lot lighter on the front end. Did you struggle with the changes since you hadn't run much and you went right to the outlaws? Well, I mean, we struggled just because, you know, I, I remember distinctly thinking I was ready to go and, and race 410s and ready to be on the outlaw tour. And, you know, I just thought, you know, I could go out and win a lot of races in 99. And, uh, you know, I should have been fired, to be honest <laughs> with you, about 50 times that year just because I wasn't ready and wasn't even close. So. Uh, I, I struggled a lot. I mean, I think I struggled with a the, the engine size and uh, just mainly a lack of experience. Didn't you know? I felt like I, I probably got on tour. Probably, you know, looking back, it was way too early. I wasn't really ready. Um, and it's a mentally brutal, you know, sport whenever you're not running well and you can't win and y you know you, you think you're ready and you don't know what's wrong. So um, you know, kind of got thrown with the wolves pretty quick. Um, 
and uh, it definitely uh, was a, a big learning curve that uh, uh, took me, you know, quite a while uh, to, you know, get better at, and, and uh, you know, seemed like you weren't making any headway. So um, it definitely was a big change for me, and, and I don't know if it was just a 360 to 410 deal or just a lack of experience um, in general um, in sprint cars. You ran with the World of Outlaws for nine years, and in 2009, you started running in Pennsylvania. Why did you make that transition and that change? Well, it wasn't by choice. <laughs> it, uh, uh, yeah, I, had, you know, I was very fortunate. I had a lot of really good rides throughout those nine years to, to run the Outlaw Tour, and um, basically got let go from the Titan uh, car in uh, the right before, about two weeks before um, Volusia um, in 09. We went to Australia and ran really bad um, for him, and, uh, he decided to make a driver change at that point, and it was about two weeks before Florida, so um, didn't have a lot of time to find a ride and got very fortunate that I was able to go to Florida in uh, Pete Postupak's 25 car and uh, was just, you know, when you do this for a living, I was scrambling to get in any car I could get into at that point and, and try to, you know, fill a schedule and uh, run enough races that I could, you know, make a living and keep paying the bills at home. So. Um, I, you know, my goal was to always be back out on the road with the Outlaws. I, I didn't, uh, uh, you know, didn't choose to get off the road. But uh, there's a lot of, there's very limited rides and I uh, kind of thought I might have to be off the road for a year and a year turned into two and two to three and then to four. So uh, definitely was questioning whether or not I was going to get another chance to, to get back out on the road and uh, was very, you know, appreciative of the, the opportunities I had in Pennsylvania and, and truthfully probably a lot of those opportunities um, I think probably grounded me a lot more and, and made me appreciate the opportunities that I had been given, you know, uh, for so many years to be out on the road and, and to not take them for granted, for sure, because it, uh, it's tough to get rides. Uh, there's very few, and uh, it's expensive to field these cars, and, um, you know, when you get good ones, you want to try to keep them. The Posse is known for being extremely tough. At the time when you started racing back with the Pennsylvania Posse, did you think the World of Outlaw competition was harder or the Pennsylvania Posse competition was harder? Well, I think the, I think the Outlaw competition is always harder for, you know, um, in general, you know, in, in a broad term of, you know, what's more difficult. Um, but when you combine the two at Williams Grove, um, you know, that's by far the, the, the toughest competition to, uh, to win a race um, is anywhere, is at Williams Grove or, or at Lincoln or, you know, really any of the, uh, you know, Pennsylvania tracks. So. Um, I think, you know, as a whole, my feeling is uh, every day we run with the best sprint car drivers. Um, that's not to say that some of the guys in Pennsylvania, if weren't given the opportunity, wouldn't be successful out on the road. I'm sure they would. But um, I feel like the outlaw guys are the best at adapting to different race tracks and going to a place once and figuring it out quick. And, and it's tough to win with them. Uh, but, you know, that being said, when you go to Williams Grove, you know those guys are good. They've got really good equipment and uh, it's a tricky racetrack that uh, is, is very difficult to beat them at. Many great drivers come from PA. Having raced up there for a couple years, do you think that helped your skills as a driver, or do you think it hurt you not being on the tour? No, it definitely didn't hurt. I, I feel like, I, I truthfully feel like it maybe helped me. Um, over those three, you know, four years that I was gone, actually two or three of those years, the Outlaws probably had the uh, least number of races that they've ever ran, um, you know, over the course of their history. I think there was one year they only had about 55 or something races, and uh, every year that I was in Pennsylvania, I had great car owners that raced a lot. So I ran 90 plus races every year. So you know there was maybe a year or two there that I almost doubled what some of the outlaw guys were running, uh, running for a lot less prize money, but therefore racing a lot more, gaining experience, and um, you know I feel like getting better. I think it helped me. I, I feel like I learned a lot at Williams Grove. Um, I think um, any guy who's going to be successful on the road with the Outlaws, you've got to be successful there. I mean, we race there six times a year. You've got to have success at Williams Grove if you're going to compete for a championship. So I definitely think that, uh, you know, over those years, I, I, I hoped I was getting better. Um, and I definitely think it made me uh, a better driver, a smarter driver for when I did get a chance to go back out on the road. Let's rewind back to the end of the 2012 season, September-ish. You, did you have anything planned for the 2013 season yet, or were you just hoping that maybe something would come about? No, I was hoping something was gonna come about, but it was still pretty early um, at that point. Uh, but Mike Hefner, who I was driving for at the time, I'd been with him for two and a half years at 27, um, was a great guy. I still talk to him quite a bit now, and 
every once in a while he'd hint towards what we were going to do the next year, and um, I did a pretty good job, I felt like, of just kind of just putting it off, you know, and, and he, he understood. He knew what my goals were. We did, I didn't hide that from him, and he knew I wanted to be back on the road, and we hadn't really spoke about next season yet, but he had already started making some plans, and um, I always like to hold out committing to him as long as possible, hoping that, you know, uh, a driver change was going to happen or, you know, something would come up that I could get back on the road. So, but uh, I was fortunate in 2012 that, you know, uh, Casey actually called me before, you know, our season was over yet. So uh, we still probably had a good month and a half or two months of racing left to go in 2012. And uh, I'd pretty much already knew of my, uh, you know, decision and what we were going to do in 2013. So um, it worked out great. I, I couldn't have been more excited to get the phone call from Casey to be back on the road. Um, besides telling my wife um, and my family, uh, Mike was definitely my third phone call. And the same day that Casey called, I, I called him and uh, just wanted to be up front with him about it and, and tell him. And, you know, I felt like I took a risk of him, you know, firing me right then before our season was over, which was, you know, happens a lot and, and understandably. But um, he, uh, you know, I, I remember that phone call because he was, uh, I think he was almost as excited as I was when I told him. Um, so I, I know he, I, on one hand he was disappointed I was leaving, but uh, he knew what my goals were and, and was, you know, I, I sense genuine, uh, you know, excitement in his voice that, um, you know, I was going to get the opportunity to, to uh, you know, move on and, and do what he knew I wanted to do and, and was such a good team. Before that phone call from Casey, you told me that you were questioning whether or not you'd ever get a chance to run with the World of Alt Laws. How do you emotionally handle that pressure but still have to perform on the track? Uh, it's tough because, you know, as a driver, you do this as a living. And, um, you know, we, we had some good years in Pennsylvania, but it was, you know, it was tough. It, it, you question, okay, do I want to keep doing this? You know, I basically was doing it to, to get by and to make enough money that I could, you know, it's our only form of income. So um, I was doing it to, you know, and we were just, you know, kind of keeping our head above water, hoping for the day that, you know, I can go back on the road. There's definitely hands down the, the purse is better with the outlaws and the point fund, and uh, it's definitely more lucrative. So uh, while we had some good years, there was a lot of years that I wondered, you know, how long can I do this? I mean, how long should I do this? And do I go, okay, enough's enough. I'm never going to get another chance. Um, maybe I need to look at doing something different. Um, it, those decisions are always more difficult when you're struggling. Uh, it's easy to want to go, man, I, I really should stay home and look at doing something different and, and uh, living a more normal life and, and a more responsible life when you have a wife and a, a daughter. So uh, it definitely uh, weighed on me a lot. My wife knew it weighed on me a lot. We had, you know, begin speaking of, you know, what other opportunities or what uh, other options that we had to, um, uh, to, to move on and do something different besides sprint car racing. So I never wanted to quit, but um, there's times that it definitely crosses your mind, uh, you know, whether or not you're good enough, whether or not you're going to get the chance, and, and whether or not, uh, you know, you're, you're chasing a dream that's not going to happen, or if you just, you know, keep your head down and, and keep fighting for it and, and, uh, and hope it all works out. But uh, I can tell you, when you get married and have kids, that, that uh, you know, you always want to tell people don't ever give up on your dreams, but, uh, you know, reality sets in that when bills keep rolling in that, uh, you know, you've got to make logical, you know, uh, good decisions. And I've uh, been very fortunate for a lot of years that um, I've been able to continue dra racing, and uh, this is what I want to do. I love it, and I, I don't want to do anything different for sure. Getting that phone call from Casey, the rumor mill in the sprint car world, you hear a lot of different things. Did you maybe hear beforehand that he was considering you, hoping, did you, did you know anything about it? Well, I can tell you from my standpoint what, you know, my vision of what happened mm -hmm. and uh, what, you know, I'm sure his story, you know, what happened here at KKR before I have, you know, have no idea. I, uh, I remember hearing word that, uh, you know, Joey had been let go and, and that was that was kept fairly quiet. You know, there was never any you know official statements from KKR that Joey was being let go. But I think everybody pretty much knew it. And um, I remember getting some phone calls that you know they were parting ways at the end of the year. And and I remember I waited about two or three days. And I, I always hate being the driver that you know as soon as you hear a rumor, you're the first guy to call and 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 beg for a job. So I remember waiting a couple of days. And and I remember sending Casey a text message. And and I just sent him a message and said. You know, I hear you're making some changes for next season. 
um, is there any chance that, uh, you know, I'm in the possibility or any running for uh, uh, replacing Joey? And um, he just texted me back and he wrote, uh, absolutely. He said, um, you're definitely one of the ones at the top of the list. I'll call you next week and we'll talk about it. And I was ecstatic with the response <laughs> that I got. Mm -hmm. I was, you know, couldn't be happier that uh, that was, um, you know, the response that he gave me. And, and I believe this was like on a Thursday or Friday and I went and raced that weekend. And, and uh, sure enough, I mean, he just said, I'll call you next week. Well, about 10 o'clock or noon, it was pretty early on a, on a Monday, you know, my phone rang and it was Casey. And, and so I figured, well, okay, you know, he just wants to talk about it a little bit. And um, he basically offered me the job in the first five minutes on the phone call. So uh, it was a shock. You know, I figured, you know, when he said you're at the top of the list, I figured he's got three or four guys that he's looking at. It's going to take some time to uh, make a decision. But uh, it happened so fast. I was... My wife wasn't even home. I think she'd taken my daughter to school or something. And, and so I'm on the phone with him and, and, you know, it happened so quick. I didn't even, you know, I didn't hesitate, but to say yeah. yes, but uh, I remember just being excited and being shocked that it happened that quick and, uh, you know, couldn't wait for her to get home and, and, uh, you know, let her know. What preparations did you and your family make and you as a driver make for the 2013 season with it being such a big transition for you? Uh, none. That was the best part, I think, about Pennsylvania. It was I already had a motorhome for so many years being on the road. Um, when we raced in Pennsylvania, uh, we didn't change anything. Uh, you know, we kept our motorhome and we, you know, didn't move. We stayed in Indianapolis. And so uh, I would commute back and forth a lot of weekends um, if we just raced on a Friday and Saturday. But then once we got busy around May, June, July, and August, uh, we'd take the motorhome and, and just go to Pennsylvania and live out of it for three or four months. Um, great friends of ours, Tommy and Steph Ryder, we, left, we used to park in there uh, at their shop and, and we got power and water and, and just made a lot of good friends. And so we still lived the same life. We just didn't, uh, maybe didn't drive the motorhome as much, but we still lived out of it. So uh, when we did get the opportunity to go back on the road, you know, we, it wasn't a huge lifestyle change for us. My daughter still, that's all she knew was, you know, race season around, we live in the motorhome and go from track to track. And um, you know, we're not home that much or we'll go home for a couple of days here and there. So, um, you know, I was really fortunate that the way we raced in Pennsylvania, you know, it was still kept us busy, but I was, you know, able to keep our motor home for those years and, and it didn't really change our lifestyle much. At the start of the 2013 season, new crew chief, new car, new everything for you. Did you think realistically you could win a championship being off the road for so long? No. <laughs> I, you know, I'd, I'd love to tell you I did, but I, I really didn't. You know, I was nervous. I was extremely nervous. I was, you know, it was a, a dream come true opportunity. Um, you know, one that, you, you know, I'd been begging for for four years to get the opportunity to get back out on the road, but then to do it with, you know, a team that, you know, had been battling for a championship really the last three, four or five years. Um, you know, it, it was exciting, but yet a lot of pressure came along with that. Um, you know, all, all you heard was, how am I going to replace the, the, the former driver that was there? And trust me, those thoughts ran through my head also. So um, it was uh, exciting, but nerve wracking. And, and I just felt like it might take us a little while. Um, I knew that uh, the people that were there were right. I knew that uh, we would get there, um, you know, eventually. Uh, but I didn't expect for us to start as, as strong as we did and for me to be as comfortable in the car. and and for you know, me to understand what Kale was saying and for him to, I feel like, respond to what I was saying as, as good as we did. Darren, you've been racing your whole life and drivers work their whole career in hopes of winning a World of Outlaw Championship. You've done it at 36 years old. How, what advice would you give to young kids growing up and how would you suggest that they get to where you are? I'm only 35, first oh. off. <laughs> well, my bad. I can't yeah, do that okay. then. <laughs> uh, so, but uh, my advice is um, just do it right. You know, I mean, I think that's one thing that my dad mainly just always instilled in me that no matter what, when, when, whether or not it was quarter midget racing or, or how, you know, uh, inimportant it seemed like at the time, it was just, you know, do it right because you don't know who's watching you. And I think, you know, so many young kids today have a, vision of they want to do it different and they want to do it their own way and I just um, you know you just need to treat people the right way um, be very appreciative of, of the opportunities what little help somebody may give you um, and you know in, in my case it, it worked exactly how you know you always hoped or dreamed it would it was it was always the, the next opportunity that led to the next one and 
you never know who's watching and, and what opportunity or what position that you're putting yourself in that may open up a door that, you know, takes you where you need to go. And so, you know, I just think, uh, you know, young kids just need to uh, just always remember they never know who's watching and, and always just treat every opportunity as, as a chance to make an impression on uh, who's watching because they never know who it is and they never know what, uh, you know, what door that's going to open. You talked about your family traveling with you, your wife Mandy, your daughter Taylor. Mandy grew up around racing. Her father raced. She grew up around the racetracks down in Memphis. Does she ever give you advice? Does she critique you? How does your guys' relationship work on that side? I don't know if she gives me advice. She definitely critiques. <laughs> um, but uh, I, I wouldn't want it any other way. I mean, you know, that's, she definitely grew up around it, knows what she's talking about. Um, it's actually funny because, uh, you know, she's done it for so long. Uh, me and Terry McCarl are good friends, and, and our wives work the t-shirt trailers a lot. And it's funny because there's a lot of times we want to shake their heads like, man, they don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> but I tell you what, like, they can sit up there in the t-shirt trailer and, like, not even be watching and it's funny how accurate they are about they can hear when an engine's running right or when it's not running right. And they've done it for so long that, you know, they, um, you know, they, they do. I mean, they know what they're listening for and what they're hearing. And, and you know, she's, she's done this, you know, she's been by my side, really. I mean, we started dating in 96 when I first started driving sprint cars. So, um, you know, I've been married 11 years now. So. You know, she's been, you know, to 90% of, along with my sprint car career with me. So um, she's not new at it. And um, there's a lot of times we, I, I'll disagree with her. Uh, but uh, normally if I'll sit back and um, think about it, she's, uh, you know, as much as I hate to admit it, she's probably right more than, uh, than she's wrong and, and more than I am, that's for sure. And your daughter, Taylor, yeah. she's young. She's four, I believe, just about ready to turn five. And... Uh, her little deal is she likes to call you the line leader. Does she ever get mad at you or criticize you for not winning? Uh, a little bit. She started that a little bit. Uh, she doesn't understand when, you know, if you finish second or third, she'll be a little disappointed that, you know, she just only associates winning with getting her picture made. <laughs> so, um, and obviously she wants to win. So it's hard to, um, uh, you know, for her to grasp that, you know, sometimes second and third is still good. Mm -hmm. um, but in the same token, she doesn't understand when we run 15th that that's bad also. So, um, you know, I, it, it all depends uh, on what she sees and, and how dusty it is. Because she, a lot of times she'll watch, but if it's dusty, she's done. She'll just wake up at the end or look up to see and, and first thing she'll say, you know, where did he finish or did daddy win? Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, she doesn't understand necessarily where you finish, but if you don't win, that, then, then she's always a little bit disappointed. Um, and uh, so she, she definitely, you know, is already getting some of the competitive side and, you know, being at home, we're always, you know, chasing each other and everything always turns into a race and, and uh, you know, if she doesn't win, she can, uh, you can tell she's not happy. So we definitely, uh, both me and wife have a pretty competitive side to us and, and uh, unfortunately I'm sure we're instilling that into her also. With that being said, you both being competitive, she grew up around racing, you race, will Taylor ever race? I hope not. <laughs> I, I, I truly hope not. I don't know how um, we uh, keep her from it. Um, I just hope that she doesn't want to. Uh, I, you know, we'll support her in whatever she you know, really wants to do. And, and I realize when she's around something this much, it, it'd be hard for her to not want to be involved to, you know, to some degree. Um, we're just uh, not sure exactly, you know, what that's going to be yet. Uh, I'm sure it's creeping up on us a lot closer than we'd like to admit, but um, I hope she's interested in, in a lot of other things besides racing. Well, sitting here with you, Darren, looking around the shop, it seems after speaking with you, you've got what you would call your dream job, but we want to wish you the best of luck in 2014 and with the rest of your career. Thank Thanks. you. Thanks. Appreciate it. I'm Darren Pittman, and you're watching Three Wide Life. I'm Darren Pittman, and you're watching Three Wide Life. I'm Darren Pittman, and this is Three Wide Life.